Ladies and gentlemen, before starting with the introduction of Professor Nikodar, please let me say a few words <coughs> of appreciation to the organizer for this meeting and uh, first of all to, <coughs> to Professor Tonin and uh, Dr. Pugliese. There are several reasons to be proud to be here uh, this evening and uh, probably <coughs> the most important aspect of, uh, uh, of this meeting is because, uh, and I will try to explain this to you in a uh, uh, in few words, is once again demonstrate that most of the advances we can make in our society, in this case in the health systems, they come from research. So the value of research is something which cannot be capitalized next day, it takes time. It takes time to realize how we can apply our advancement in terms of uh, application to the goodness <coughs> of the human being. And uh, of course, I appreciate the words of uh, uh, the Mr. President of Calabria region because he introduced the right problem we are now facing. is the globalization of the human problems and the, the health correlated with age is one of the most important problems at the moment. And uh, the reason why I've said uh, these previous few words is because, in my opinion, Professor Pierluigi Nicotera, which is a neuroscientist probably most of you know, is the example how the progression of science in a single person or in a community of uh, scientists is something which then can produce results which cannot imagine at the beginning. Professor Pierluigi Nicotera is the director of a probably what is actually in Europe the most impressive in terms of research, research and uh, production, scientific production in Europe in terms of uh, uh, production in neuroscience. This institute, the Desenie, that you would forgive me for not uh, pronounce in German. So the Desenie is one of the most productive entity now in Europe in terms of a basic research, translational research, clinical research. And probably it's the most uh, searched institute in Europe by all the actors in any country because of the organization level they have reached under the guide of Professor Pierluigi Nicotera. Pierluigi Nicotera is uh, the, health, the scientific director of this Desenie since 2009, called on this important venture by Mrs. Merkel, and the 5th of April this year, they have celebrated the 10th anniversary of the Institute. But Professor Nicotera comes from far away. Professor Nicotter is Calabrian in origin. He is a neuroscientist, but indeed he is a medic laureate in Pavia. In early 80s, all of us could move around Europe and out of Europe because there was uh, such a, a possibility for us to be hosted in the most impressive institute around the world. And it just happened that Professor Nicotera ended in the lab, which was run at that time by a person which is now considered a giant in the basic research in Europe and worldwide. Steno Renius is the father of cellular and molecular toxicology. He worked in pharmacology for ages. And Professor Nicotera there, in the 80s, contributed very much to our understanding how a cell would die because of an insult. At that time, it was an hepatocyte, eh? because of an insult caused by an increase of simple divalent cation, calcium. At that time, nobody would imagine how much road would be done with the, the calcium studies. Professor Pierluigi Nicotera has the major opportunity to better understand the role of calcium 
and probably shifted from the hepatocytes to the neuron, which is a completely, totally different cell. But indeed, the application of the rigorous basic research methodologies allowed him to identify different types of calcium toxicity for the cell. And it just happened to demonstrate that low amount of calcium increasing all the time in the cell, in the neuron, with the insults, which are no major insults like ischemia, like, for instance, trauma, but little insult caused by, let's say, disorders in the uh, uh, oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria would be combined with this increase in calcium, which eventually may make a neuron derange and go into a damage which may lead the cell to die. And this is the, the most important publication in the 90s around the role of calcium in apoptosis, which at that time also generated this interesting venture between me and Professor Nicotera and our friend Jerry Melino. In Calabria, we started with these meetings on apoptosis. You remember, so every second year meeting in apoptosis, joining most of the international people around working on this uh, argument that it became the most important aspect of cell death. But now we are other aspects of death, which is how death is modulated. And the Professor Nicotta over the years uh, produced a number of evidence for the role of epigenetics on the control of age-related disease, of age-related damage to the central nervous system. So therefore, all this experience took Professor Nicotta around the world and uh, collaborating with the most impressive centers for neurodegenerative disease in the United States, in, uh, in the Far East, and uh, everywhere. So there is a collaboration between Professor Nicotta and all these centers for uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And the publications made, the production made by Professor Nicotta is really impressive stuff. So I'm not celebrating Professor Nicotta because it doesn't need me to do it, but uh, the most of the production in uh, this field made by Pierluigi is something which has generated most of the activity around the Desenay. This is the point I made at the beginning, how basic science can then be spent for organizing something which is immediately transferable to the humankind. But there is another reason to be proud to be here, for me here, because I've been serving the National Research Committee at the Health Ministry, Dr. Leonardi, uh, in those years, so since uh, the 2004 to 2010, I have learned how important is the role of the Ministry of Health in guiding the evolution of the health system. And indeed, IRCS are reference institutes for our ministry. And these institutes are something really knowledgeable, but not for what we think is the uh, the aspect referred to the uh, uh, patient, but for the innovation they are able to make in the health system. The innovation in the science, in research, in basic biomedical research, and the trans translational research. And uh, of course, in the diagrams you have pointed, you have demonstrated, there is none in Calabria. And in those years, uh, I have really have been very much frustrated because all the ministers passed by were all convinced that there was a need for an institution such as NIRCS in Calabria because it was something to help improving the quality of the health system of this region. And I'm very puzzled to know whether the lack of NIRCS in Calabria may be correlated to the lack of good evolution of the health system in this region. So, but... Uh, to make it the story short, the idea is that the, the network of the IRCS in Italy is something that we should work for 
to improve them, to enhance the impact on the daily living of the health system, of the hospitals diffused on our uh, uh, regions, but most of all, should also be considered the place where the young scientists trained in our university may find a place where to exercise their intelligence. And this must be needed also for Calabria. So therefore, I would like to stop here my intervention and uh, would like to call Professor Pierluigi Nicotter to the stage. And uh, I will tell you that uh, every time I hear his lectures, is always something new, which is really interesting. So please follow him. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, Professor Vegeta Gigi, thank you very much for this introduction. I better give a good talk after what you said, and um, you put me on the spot now. Uh, my thanks, of course, go to Paolo Tonin, to Giovanni Pugliese, and to all the people who have organized this conference here in uh, Crotone, which I think, as the other speakers have said before me, it's the right place, and it could not be a better place to be able to gather people from all over the world to discuss these important topics. Uh, I just would like to say that I, I am a Calabrian. I'm, I'm proud of being a Calabrian. I always was. And I, wherever I was in the world, I left Calabria when I was very young, I've always tried to be able to keep the links, and especially through the collaboration with, uh, with uh, Professor Badget over the years, but uh, more recently with the collaboration with the Santana Institute. Um, for me, there is an engagement in trying to be able to uh, cooperate. And here I must apologize because the problem is that uh, I have everything to learn here. I'm not trying to uh, tell you anything that uh, in your field you don't know already. We have to learn from the experience of rehabilitation or tele-rehabilitation that uh, is going on around the world, particularly here in Crotone. Because in Germany, unfortunately, this area of research is not a well developed yet. Uh, we have pioneered part of the research uh, on uh, uh, rehabilitation or at least on early diagnosis and follow-up of Alzheimer's patients. And I strongly believe that rehabilitation in this field may also be extremely useful to be able to change the trajectory of the disease in these individuals. This is the reason why a year ago I came here to visit the Institute, uh, the Instituto Santana, and Giovanni Pugliese, Paolo Tonin, and I started to discuss why don't we actually cooperate and start something together. And uh, especially with the Oberon project, which has developed here extremely well, I think this could be a, a very good model also to be applied to Alzheimer's disease. It's interesting, in Calabria we have uh, an estimated number of 30,000 people with dementia. And, and the problem is that these people will grow. The number will grow because we get older, simply. This is all over the world. And so I think we have to have a project, a plan on how to deal with these people even before we find therapies on how to handle those people who are already sick. We need to know how to treat them, how to help families to cope with that. And here, rehabilitation and telemedicine could play a tremendous role. So as I said, I have a lot to learn. So you will forgive me for uh, uh, giving you a general overview on Alzheimer's disease, primarily, where we are, what are we doing, which are the novelties here. And then at the very end, I will touch back on rehabilitation and especially on, on new computer technologies that will enable safe sharing of data, which is very important. I say in all fields of medicine, but particularly in telemedicine. So obviously, uh, everybody knows that Alzheimer's disease is uh, uh, characterized by a decline of cognitive functions. This is the most obvious symptoms, but obviously uh, Alzheimer's disease is not only these. Patients tend to uh, develop a number of other symptoms, and uh, over the periods, over the years, they are an increasing burden for the families, it's a very, very disruptive disease. And, uh, and we are not equipped yet to force, in a way, the trajectory of the disease in a way that can be milder. It varies from individual to individual. Nevertheless, we have no therapies to stop the disease. We have palliative cures. We, have, we can cure some symptoms like aggression, for example, or psychosis. But we are not in a position to change the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease which means that the only 
thing that we can do is to search completely in the true spectrum of translation from very fundamental to clinical research ways by which we can change this trajectory. In Germany, we have 1.7 million currently with Alzheimer's disease, and uh, the projection is that this number will nearly double in the next 20, 30 years. In Italy, it's more or less the same. The trajectory in the Western world are very much the same. So you go from the US to Europe to all the industrialized countries, the, the numbers are more or less the same in terms of increase. Uh, the countries where Alzheimer's disease is increasing the most are the Far East countries, particularly China, because, of course, the quality of life is increasing. And, uh, and of course, what happens it is that the medical care is improving, people get older, they have uh, a different type of life, and therefore they are expected to have a tremendous peak in uh, dementias in the next coming 30 years. Uh, if you look actually at the, um, at the changes in cause of that, these are data from the United States on the left panel, uh, between 20, um, 20, 2000 sorry, and 2015, you can see that actually the major diseases, uh, uh, different forms of cancer like breast, prostate cancer, uh, and also stroke, HIV infections are decreasing. And in red, you see actually the mortality from Alzheimer's disease is increasing progressively. It's interesting that two years ago in the UK, uh, dementia was ra ranked as the number one killer. Uh, by, the, by the Department of Health, because they now start to attribute to dementia all deaths, for example, by infections, respiratory diseases, and others, which are coming at the end stage of the disease. So they are really computing them as deaths due to dementia and not necessarily to infectious diseases. The risk of developing dementia increases dramatically with age, and you can see that above 85 years, I think, is a pretty a significant risk. And uh, the aging population on the panel on the, uh, here on my, on my right side, you see that actually the uh, people who are 80 years and, and older, or 65 to 79, are increasing. So that's automatically a guarantee to be able to have more age-related diseases. And it's also interesting that uh, a number of causes which probably can be attributed to Alzheimer's disease may be shared by other diseases. We have a progressive increase in certain forms of cancer in old age. We have in increases in the incidence of diabetes. And we have, of course, increases in dementia, different forms of dementia, which means that probably there are some common causes that favor all these age-related diseases. And we will discuss this later. So the, the problem with dementia it is that it is an economic burden and also a heavy burden for the families. So if you really look at the uh, cost in Germany calculated for 2016, uh, you can see that actually there is a direct cost for the healthcare system of 30,000 euro per patient per year. And uh, if you really look at the cost of the public direct service plus the private cost, you see that the private cost is significantly higher because families are taking care of the patients. Also, uh, there is a heavy burden for the family because of course, families uh, like uh, parents of uh, uh, children of, with parents with Alzheimer's disease lose working hours, meaning that they don't go to work, they lose uh, time. There are a lot of uh, related problems like stress amongst caregivers, and the first caregivers are the families. And you see here statistics telling uh, how actually um, they may be affected by having a uh, relative with Alzheimer's disease. As I say, the causes and the mechanism of these diseases are largely unknown. After decades of research, we still are not sure which are the real causes for dementia. Most likely, we're not talking about one disease. We're talking about several diseases. We're talking about only one component, which is the so-called Alzheimer's disease, with the pathology described by Eloise Alzheimer. The rest is a mixed form of dementia with vascular causes, other forms of dementia like frontotemporal dementia, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, dementia in people with Parkinson's disease. So we have a different group of diseases. Now this is actually quite a problem for clinical trials because the regulatory agencies even now require that you include in the trial all large groups of dementia people. So of course, try to imagine if you would do a clinical trial today and say, let's cure cancer. And we take people with uh, 10 different forms of cancer and we try to treat them with the same medicine. Of course, it would never work. The trial would fail. So that's one of the major reasons. There is no patient stratification, and therefore clinical trials are failing. 
I will tell you the other reasons why clinical trials are also failing uh, in a while, but this is also something that has to be brought to the attention of the regulatory agencies. We are actively working with the German regulatory agency BFARM, which is also part of EMEA, to try to change the rules to make basically trials in Alzheimer's disease stratified in selective group of people who have selective markers for one of the types of dementia. And uh, we also don't have models. We have, you know that we work a lot with animal models to try to understand the mechanisms of disease, but there are no really models that recapitulate the whole progression of dementia. So if we use mice, if we use rats, uh, if we use flies, if we use worms to do the research, we can only model single aspects of the disease, but never recapitulate the entire pathology, which means that in the end we can cure or we can try to interfere with one process, not with all of them. And dementias are not brain diseases, they are systemic diseases. They are present in the whole body and they manifest in the whole body and most likely are generated probably by conditions which are whole body conditions like inflammation, changes in immunity, and things which are not selectively acting on the brain. The brain is simply the most sensitive target for this. So the German government in 2007 and 8 decided to tackle the problem of dementia by creating a new institute. So the initiative was taken by the Chancellor in Angela Merkel, but also by the Minister of Science at that time, Annette Chavan, who decided to be able to create a new type of institute that would actually bring back together the experience of the uh, best scientists in Germany and put it under a single institute, trying to recruit, of course, new people from outside, not dissimilar from the network that uh, Dr. Leonardi was telling us before, and actually is uh, pretty modest in this, but is a driving force behind this, together with Fabrizio Tagliavini, to create a more connected network in Italy as well. So the idea came from um, Annette Chavan and, and from Merkel, and they decided to be able to put together a committee, and the committee, within a very short period of time, made a call, and in this call, there were a number of centers applying, and so uh, DZNE was created. DZNE stands, uh, stands for the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases. Currently, our budget is about 90 million per year, plus uh, 30 million, a little bit more in external funding, so we can count over 120 million euro per year. And we are funded primarily by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research and 90% uh, and the federal states uh, can contribute 10%. So if we were to be transferring this in Italy, of course each region where one of these centers would be would contribute 10%. Uh, we have a acquired additional centers after the beginning. Uh, this has been a competitive uh, call and we work pretty closely with the universities. So we are an extra university organization, meaning that we are a legally independent organization. However, we work closely with a number of universities. Wherever we are, we have one or two universities. For example, in Munich, we have LMU and TUM. Uh, we have, for example, in Rostock and Greifswald, two universities. And in different places, we have all contracts with university clinics, which means we act as a single body. If we have to run a clinical trial, we can do that. And we actually sponsor the clinical trial, and we can do it throughout Germany. So we have created not only a research institute, but a national platform to be able to investigate, study dementia, but also test medicine and develop new uh, care uh, protocols. So why, why can't we cure Alzheimer's disease? Well, I mean, the, one of the things that we uh, have learned in different ways, it is that disease actually begins tens of years, perhaps even two decades or more before the symptoms manifest. So which means that we can be perfectly fine at the age of 60 or the age of 65, and then of course at the age of 85 we may develop Alzheimer's disease, but the process has begun about 20 years before. It's a slow process where of course the neurons, the nerve cells are dying, but also where we have inflammation in the brain, where other cells of the brain are getting involved, where there are damages to the vasculature, Eventually, the trajectory is the one which is illustrated here. I don't think you can see the pointer. Can you see the pointer? No, really. Okay, I don't know if I can point any in any other way, but uh, if you look at the trajectory here, you can see that the normal people at the beginning or what are healthy donor, does that work? 
I think it's just because it's the screen which, uh, which doesn't allow the point to be seen. And I, can I point here? No, I cannot point here. Okay, doesn't matter. I think you can see the image anyway. So the disease begins probably decades before because there is a, a, a problem of uh, accumulation of misfolded protein. The two most important ones are called amyloid beta and tau. Tau is inside the neurons, amyloid beta is outside the neurons. And so the general idea that these proteins are accumulating and causing damage in the brain has been around for 20 years or more. The problem with is all the trials, all the clinical trials, they have targeted amyloid beta, they have been trying to remove this protein from the brain, have failed. Just two weeks ago, the last trial made by Biogen and ASI has been closed prematurely because of lack of efficacy of the antibodies which were used to be able to clear this protein. So why do they fail? Well, I can tell you at least three reasons. The first one is the patient stratification, if you just heard. The second one, which is unfortunately known in the field, but nobody speaks about, is the fact that you have to measure the amount of amyloid you have left in brain to make sure that your drug is working. Your target is amyloid, so you want to measure amyloid. Well, the problem is that the measurements of amyloid with the PIB, which is a PET tracer, are not telling you whether there is amyloid gone or, or still in the brain. It just monitors the lack or the, the dissolution of plaques. But if there are small fragments, oligomers, of a beta, PIB is not capable of measuring that. So we may very well be that we still have amyloid in the brain. That's why the trials don't work, because the antibodies are not efficient. The other one, of course, is the patient stratification. And the third, it could be because in, we intervene too late at the time in which the neurons are already dead. And so even if we remove these plaques, this accumulation of garbage in the brain, we are not able to cure the disease. So we need to go earlier. We need to try preventive strategies. We need to go with preventive trials also with the regulatory agencies. And we need to address different mechanisms of disease. And I will show you a little bit of what we have been doing over the past few years in this direction. So the first thing we did, I apologize for the German slide, but what we have done, we have engaged the, together with the United States into uh, recruiting cohort of people, of families, where the parents develop Alzheimer's disease in a genetically dependent manner. So it's an autosomal dominant disease. And uh, the children of these people are expected to deliver disease in the same number of years. They usually get disease between 45 and 50. It's like a clock. So the parents develop the disease at that age, and the children are expected to develop the disease at that age. So we collected 200 families now around the world. Germany actually is the second one after the US in recruitment. We have 500 uh, people involved in the study. And uh, in Germany, we have 60 uh, and 20 families, basically, 60 people and 20 families. What is the advantage here? Is that we take people, children of these people who are 19 years old, 18 years old. We can take their blood samples, we can image their brain, and we can follow them over the time. So what's the advantage for them? Well, of course, if we would have a therapy, they're going to be the first one to be treated because they don't have the disease. But we also can find signs of the disease in these children 20 years, 25 years before they are supposed to develop it. So, uh, for example, in this article, which has been published by one of our groups in Tübingen, very recently we have demonstrated that the neurofilament protein light chain, both in blood and in the, in the CSF, can be used as a marker for onset of the disease and uh, it will enable us to be able to detect disease about 16 years before it manifests. Now, the interesting thing with this is that this neurofilament property is not a specific marker for Alzheimer. You will find it in stroke, you will find it in other diseases, but in this particular cohort, because these people are known to develop the disease, then it becomes automatically something which will enable us to reveal that these people have already a pathological process going on 16 years before they get the disease. And so if you couple this now with a number of other detection systems which have more specificity for Alzheimer's disease, perhaps we can come to a very early diagnosis and therefore from the early diagnosis trying to treat these people earlier on. Of course, the, this you can see on the left panel there, 
It's just the number of samples collected and the people that shows you that there is a, a deflection in the red line 16 years before the predicted onset of disease. Of course, this has made the news, was on CNN, on The Guardian, and so on. Uh, the German newspaper were very excited. Our minister was very excited because the measure funding coming from this effort. But this is only just one little milestone. To be able to diagnose the disease early enough, it is only one thing. We need to cure it. We need to prevent it. We need to go ahead with uh, different um, strategies. But there is another measure of form of dementia which uh, we observe continuously in patients, not only Alzheimer's disease, and this is vascular dementia. And this community, of course, is very much interested in stroke, on the consequences of stroke. And if you really look at the uh, uh, data that we have collected over the years through one of our cohorts, it's the second most common cause of dementia. Uh, it is a sort of a bystander, which means you can have mixed forms of dementia, which begin as vascular injury, and then they transform in neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, of course, one of the key issues here is the small vessel disease, which is one uh, disease which, of course, is common in many people, which has pathology of the small vessel of the circulation in the brain, and the incidence of dementia after having small vessels disease or stroke increases significantly, primarily when we talk about white matter strokes, not the classical hemorrhagic strokes. And uh, in the study, which is called EMDAS, that we run, this is any mechanism of dementia after stroke, now we can actually find that there is a significant risk, especially of repetitive strokes, which are manifested in uh, in uh, individuals, especially in the white matter. And this has, had been predicted already by epidemiological studies, and we have now the evidence that this is indeed the case in follow-up uh, of patients with um, white matter stroke having cognitive decline. And interestingly enough, the stroke caused long-lasting elevation of the same protein that we find in Alzheimer's disease, the NFL protein. So now, in these patients, by combining the infarct volume by the uh, NFL, which correlates very well, we can already predict from the degree of damage which is in the brain, which subject may eventually develop dementia. And of course, this is done by correlating this with the in-depth imaging. And of course, the level of NFL correlates with the generation of the white matter tracks after stroke. So that's the most important thing. These are unpublished data yet, but in principle show you that we can predict immediately after stroke which kind of individuals may have increased risk of developing dementia, which means at this point rehabilitation in these people may change this trajectory. So that's one of the things that could be definitely done in this set of uh, studies to see whether we can modify these trajectories. So let's go back to the, um, to the figure that I showed you before. So what about if these episodes that we see are not really the causes of the disease, but they're just epiphenomena? What if, for example, these proteins that we see altered in brain are not really uh, the mechanism by which neurons die, but simply a consequence of some age-related processes? So is it the genetic predisposition? or is it age-related failure of housekeeping mechanisms the most important thing? So after all, we get older, there are a number of things that don't work very well anymore, and so maybe these are the key factors, epigenetic factors, which may cause the disease. So these factors can be inflammation, aging, and metabolism. So think, think about, now we go a little bit more in a hypothetical field, but look at the increased life expectancy on the left one. It's almost a straight line. So if you look at the beginning of the century, or even in the last, in the 19th century, the expectation of life was actually around 50 years, the average of 50 years. Now we have nearly double life expectation. So if we double life expectation, we can't think that there are genetic mechanisms behind, because it would take generations for them to be able to cause mutation. That's a key concept in genetics, to be able to have a mutation which gives you an advantage you have to wait several generations. So it's only 100 years. So it's very, very difficult that these kind of changes that we observe, both in longevity, but in sensitivity to disease, are due to the genetics alone. And also, who actually selected to get Alzheimer's disease at the age of 80 or 85? Selections usually happen at younger ages for diseases. And therefore, you know, there is no advantage in a way to survive or not Alzheimer's disease at the age of 85. So then it's very much likely that there is 
indeed an epigenetic phenomenon, so something which the environment has introduced or spontaneous adaptation to the long life. If the fact that we live longer, let me try to explain it in a different way. It's not so, it's not for free. We live longer, we live twice as long, but the, the organism has to adapt to this, uh, to this life. And because it cannot be genetic adaptation, it has to be a, an epigenetic adaptation. So we have to change those systems which control the way by which genes are working. I hope this concept is clear, because if we would have to have a genetic adaptation, we would have progressive mutations which would be acquired by our offspring, and to be able to be fixed over time, this would require several generations. If you look at, uh, at children with the Down syndrome, which of course they develop dementia quite uh, rapidly, well, look in 1990, 25% of these people, they were living actually 25 years, about 23%, 25% living a life of 25 years. Look at this now in uh, today. We double the lifespan in children with uh, Down syndrome. So how can we do that? Of course, because we prevent a cardiovascular risk. That's the main factor. But how can they get used to live twice as much? Try, you have a car, a Fiat, and the Fiat is made to go 100,000 kilometers. The Germans would say Mercedes goes 300,000, but, but you know, it depends on where you see the thing. Fiat cars have improved tremendously. But now, if you run the car for 100,000 kilometers and you have to go into the next 100,000 kilometers, well, you know, you have to have a more robust car. You have to adapt because, of course, they are not made to live so long. So that's what I'm trying to say is that the primary things that we are basically looking at are epigenetics and not genetics. And here is the number of experiments that show you, for example, in the left uh, paper, which is done from Daniele Bano and my group, we actually using uh, uh, worms, which are living about 21 days. Uh, we can make them live longer. We can make them living like uh, up to 80 days, so we could quadruplicate their life by simply interfering with the metabolism, like with insulin pathways. But if we actually mutate one single histone, which is a component of the architecture of the cellular nucleus, now we completely abolish the effect due to aging. So there are ways by which we can manipulate aging, we can make life longer, but also by which we can interfere with life. And the interesting thing is this experiment here done by another group, Dan Henninger in Bonn, where actually they decided to do a simple experiment. They mated old male mice with young females and they compare them to matings of the same age. And it turned out that if the old male mice were mating with young female, then you look at the offspring, the offspring was unable to learn as well as the others. So this means that you can inherit epigenetic traits. So for all of, like people like me who actually I'm glad I have two daughters, which seems to be pretty cognitively normal, but I got married when I was relatively old, and so the one is 13, now one is 17. They are, they are doing well. But of course, when I saw these results, I got a bit scared. <laughs> I, of course, you know, it, it tells you one thing. That you can, the, the key thing it is you can inherit epigenetic factors. These are, cannot be genetic mutations, of course. So these are environmental modifications of your sperm line, most likely, which then reflects in a accelerated defects in aging in the offspring. So marry young. Uh, so th this is another example of factors which actually can affect cognitive activity and, uh, and uh, dementia. And it's a very nice work from our colleagues in Cologne where they actually show the very interesting thing. If uh, the brain does not utilize glucose very well, then they try to be able to produce a peripheral inflammation in the periphery, move the cells to the brain. The cells rebuild up the glucose transport by upregulating the transporter. And so the brain can continue to be able to use energy. And when the brain uses energy, it kills those proteins I showed you before, like amyloid and tau. It metabolizes them. But what does the brain do in this case? It produces diabetes. Because to protect itself, it creates a peripheral inflammation, insulin resistance, and diabetes, which is philosophically also very interesting. You know, say so the brain is the most important organ. It tries to be able to enslave the rest of the body to maintain itself in a good fit function. And of course, diet, because diet is, is a key thing. And this is another paper from Bonn, from a group in Bonn, showing actually that if you have fat diet, 
you change your immune system. And if you change your immune system, you actually upregulate one particular form of the innate immune system, the NALP3 system, which actually is involved in formation of plaques in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. So these are basically all factors that can favor uh, aging. And the, the immune system is a fantastic target for therapy because we can address the immune system in, in general. So for example, we underestimate the importance of oral, oral hygiene. So a, a bad oral hygiene with infections, chronic infection in the mouth can favor the onset of chronic inflammation and therefore facilitate Alzheimer's disease. And so on, the diet we have talked about and different other mechanisms, which of course now we are trying to unveil. I don't want to bother you too much with all these papers, but in principle uh, showing that there is a growing body of evidence that targeting the immune system and targeting inflammation may actually help us to prevent Alzheimer's disease. This is actually exemplified in this study, which was done together with the, the BFARM, actually, the German Agency for Drugs in uh, Germany, where actually we examined 145,000 data sets from individuals above the age of 60 who had diabetes, and they were treated with anti-diabetes drugs. And if you look at the lines on the left side, you see that the drug uh, called pioglitazone uh, actually can prevent significantly, on the left side, can, can prevent significantly the onset of, of Alzheimer's disease in diabetic people. This phenomenon is not the same for rosiglitazone, which gets into the brain and gets out from the brain very quickly, but it is something which uh, tells us that an anti-inflammatory drug, because pioglitazone is a PIPAR gamma agonist, may actually be very effective at preventing Alzheimer's disease. So the problem is that people who already have the disease will never be sensitive to these drugs because their receptor for this drug is phosphorylated, which means they are not responding. So we try to understand causes of disease, risk factors. This is done in the so-called Rhineland study in Bonn, where we basically are trying to recruit 30,000 people of the age 30 and older for the next decades. We examine them in depth. We study them, that's a very interesting cohort. I often think Calabria is perfect for this because there is a, it's similar to other regions in Germany where there is a lot of migration of young people, but a lot of elderly people who remain in the region. And they are very well characterized, could be very well characterized genetically. We have cohorts like Amalia Bruni's studies has shown several times of people with neurodegenerative diseases. So for example, this could be a, definitely a, a tremendous area to be able to do this type of studies. Here we aim to identify risk factors. So how is normal aging going? What actually modifies normal aging? And we do, of course, an in-depth uh, sampling like neurological examination. Uh, we can do exercise, we can do brain scan, cognitive examinations, and everything that is needed to be able to have a comprehensive data set for these people. We also work in uh, healthcare management. And of course, one of the things which is important also when we talk about telemedicine is to have a comparator with existing uh, healthcare systems. So in Germany, for example, there is not the figure of the dementia care manager, which we have introduced in our studies in north of Germany. So is the idea to be able to have uh, uh, somebody following the patients at home. Here we use also uh, some telemedicine, so we provide them with connections with the doctors. They agree to be followed, and they actually are followed over time via telemedicine, and we have shown that there's a tremendous improvement in their quality of life. In addition to these patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease who break a hip and they go into a hospital, nobody knows how to take care of them. I mean, this is a comorbidities are a tremendous problem because nobody's trained to be able to cure the Alzheimer patient. Be and so when they go into a hospital with a broken hip and they have aggression, psychosis, and other problems, the doctors have no idea. So we try to be able to have courses now to instruct also the doctors to see how we can basically improve the care of the people in this region uh, by uh, having them trained in, in better ways. We also have a, a website now which has been uh, developed uh, um, about a year, year and a half ago, and now basically we have a lot of downloads. There are, there are guidelines, and uh, of course we have all the, the um, documents which can be collected both by scientists and patients to look at the problem. And here are the figures. If you really look at the change in slope, 
into the, um, the, the, the interventional group where we actually have telemedicine intervention and also the care manager visiting at home. So it's a, it's a sort of a mixed form. Uh, then we definitely have a very, uh, very good effect in terms of quality of life. So now we plan to extend this from, uh, from Mecklenburg von Pommern, which is in the north, Rostock and Greifswald, to the other areas in Germany. And uh, in Germany, there is not a national healthcare system. Is depending, in a way, like, like in Italy, the, the regions or the lender are responsible, but it's not an integrated system like in the UK or like the, the health system in Italy, where effectively everybody can go in different places to be, to be uh, studied or to be cured. So in Germany, it's very much uh, parcelized. So we're trying to be able to create a backbone based on the research that can bring them back also the care. We're also trying to make new drugs. And we have a very active drug development process. We cooperate strategically with uh, uh, two companies now. One is called ChemDiv. The other one is called Orion Pharmaceutical. And it's a completely new form of cooperation where we try to invest at the same time as industry does invest. So they are more interested in developing the product. And uh, we have now another collaboration uh, which is going to be framed on the same model with ASI, which is one of the top 10 pharmaceutical industries in the world. So rehabilitation in dementia. So I, I was interested in looking into this before coming to the conference. And I did find this paper from the Cochrane collaboration in 2006, where actually they pretty much state there is no evidence for effectiveness of cognitive training and insufficient evidence to evaluate individualized cognitive rehabilitation for people with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia. Of course, they criticize the small number of randomized trial or the lack of information from existing trials. They conclude, although there are a number of reports suggesting that this approach may be helpful, there are not as yet randomized control trials of cognitive rehabilitation for people with dementia. And it was not possible to reach a conclusion about the effectiveness of this approach. Well, now, look at this. I mean, this is basically 10 years later. Now, the people are starting to change their mind and say there could be a rehabilitation program for people with Alzheimer's. We just heard in the previous lecture. And it depends very much upon the symptoms, when the intervention is done, and the progression of disease. Of course, the point with Alzheimer's disease is that trajectory will go down. So if you try to train the people, their skill will never be recovered. But you will delay this trajectory. So at the moment, without any pharmaceutical intervention, only the rehabilitation will help the family and the patient in delaying the decline trajectory. Physical exercise and social activities, which are non-pharmacological intervention, already are proven to be effective in improving the rehabilitation. And the planning day activities is very important for people. So these are very recent studies, so the, a very selective planning. And of course, this plan cannot be the same over time. The routine has to adapt because the patient will continuously decline and will have a completely different set of uh, uh, symptoms. Therefore, we need to be able to have flexible plans for this. Uh, the environment has to be favorable, so the family activities have to be good. Of course, if the patient is in a family that rejects him or her, then of course all the efficacy of these interventions are not going to be uh, good. And of course, we have to try to keep the patients out of harm, out of, um, as a caregiver also. It's important to understand the patients and to adapt to the patients. So it's, it's a very difficult task. It's not like a stereotypic task, like the one we do in other forms of rehabilitation. So uh, in this paper by Jimmy Choi and Elizabeth Twonley, then there is a set of determinant of cognitive enhancing therapy outcome in Alzheimer's patients, which now can be a complex uh, but doable uh, strategy for rehabilitation in, Al in Alzheimer people. So I think this could be a target that we could pursue together here in our collaboration, but also that in general, uh, people who are involved in rehabilitation should actually work and think about, because there are a number of studies that now prove efficacy of rehabilitation in Alzheimer's disease. And the other thing which has become very, uh, very common, and this actually refers to the experience in Japan, uh, started there, but also now in different countries, Canada, the United States, is uh, having Alzheimer people working with robots. 
And there are some robots recently developed that can even uh, and see the face of the patient and transmit information to the doctor. So then basically the doctor realizes if the patient has problems or not. And also there is some degree of empathy between the robot and the patient, which is tremendous, much more than there is with human beings. And so I think you know, this is a, a route that could be very important to explore to be able to do like the Japanese are doing, early phases of dementia, bring the patient together with the robot, uh, retrain the patient, then send the patient back home, and bring it back periodically to be able to adjust the trajectory of decline. Apparently, the Japanese experience seems to be extremely good in this area. Okay, so in Germany, telemedicine has always been a problem. Uh, there is some degree of uh, conservative approach, I would say, by the medical association. A uh, difference with the UK, uh, that has uh, even only selective telemedic-only treatment. In, uh, after, of course, seeing the patients in Germany, there has been some degree of resistance. In May 2018, uh, the General Assembly of German Physicians opted for a change in their code and conduct which would allow physicians to conduct consultation and treatment of patients solely through the use of telecommunication. Of course, you have to have a first meeting with the doctor, but then you can continue to do this. So, um, of course, you, there are still limitations. The patient must be informed about the telemedicine treatment, um, but the number of uh, experiences, I must say, is not very, very encouraging at the moment. So I think there we have a lot to learn. Uh, we have a lot to be able to continue to do. And uh, there are pilot projects, like the, uh, the one in Baden-Württemberg, which we're trying to be able to learn through it generally. But I think here, this is an area where I think other countries can teach us quite a bit because we are still behind. Now, I want to conclude by telling you something really that I get very excited about these days, which is how do we handle data? Telemedicine is an example. Intensive exchange of data for scientific purposes, genetic analysis, uh, patient clinical data, they are becoming bigger and bigger. Biology and medicine now generate many more data than physics, astronomy generate. So the point it is that to be able to get this data together, if we want to understand disease, we need to be able to share them. But of course we have to cope with very strict, especially in Europe, regulations for patient data. So how can we achieve that without infringing the patient's ability to have their data protected? So we have started to think about uh, these a few years ago. And by a series of, I don't want to tell you the story, but serendipitous type of, uh, of events, we came in contact with uh, Hewlett Packard. In particular with Hewlett Packard Enterprise Labs, which is the development component of Hewlett Packard. And all of a sudden they say, oh, well, you know, there was one of our um, scientists, his brother was working with HP. And so he said, oh, they have this new computer called, very um, creatively, the machine. And they said, well, what's the machine? Well, the machine is a new memory-based computer. So what does it mean? Well, if you have a normal computer, your iPhone, from, uh, from a normal computer, you have a ROM and a RAM. The ROM is where you store the data. And when you have to process the data, the computer takes them with the processor from the ROM brings them in the RAM, breaks them down into pieces, which then are processed individually. There is a cache, so a series of processes which take place. So finally, these things is calculated, and you have the outcome of whatever you're doing. Well, this computer does not do that. This computer does everything into one single memory, which is a giant memory, connected by photonics, which means light speed. So we say, wow, that's interesting, because then if it is so fast, we can do two things. Well, first of all, we can shorten down the time of elaboration of data. But also, we could do another thing, which is mesh computing. What does it mean, mesh computing? Well, it means that uh, you can keep the data, the patient data, where they are on these computers, and have the software on the cloud. So you don't give the data to Google or Amazon or anybody else. You just keep the software on the cloud. Then the data are kept at these the individual stations. You connect them together. The computing capability is so strong that now you can perform multiple analysis at the same time at different places. So we went to um, Palo Alto. 
So this is, of course, the classical, that's what I was telling you, the classical structure of a computer. There is the RAM, the memory, you just drive the things around. And if instead you look at the memory computer, everything happens into the same memory. So you don't need to be able to have different location for storage of data and manipulation of data. So we went to Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and it was interesting because we went there two years ago. Like we came to the Institute Santana a year ago, discussing with Giovanni and his colleagues, with Paolo Tonin, this collaboration, we went over to, to uh, Palo Alto. And at the beginning, the head of the project of the machine says, I have an hour for you uh, because I'm busy. OK, fine, so we went there. After we described what we wanted to do, he stayed for the whole day. <laughs> and after that day, we became the sole partner for Yule Packard Inter Inter Enterprise into the development of biomedical software for this new computer, which is not commercially available yet. So the only one in Europe at the moment is sitting in our basement. And uh, what we did immediately during uh, uh, the next six months, we were invited to go to these shows in Las Vegas where there are like 10,000 people and you have to go on the stage like the Apple big event and so on. And during that conference, uh, we already in the simulator had produced a tremendous, tremendous progress. And I'll show you this very simply here in this figure on the bottom. Those blue lines, those blue bars, are the speed which in different years from 2010 to 2018 uh, we're actually reducing down to be able to process genomic data. So if you take a benchmark, number of millions of sequences from genomic data, which needs to be aligned like uh, letters in a word, word in a sentence, sentence in a paragraph, paragraph in a book page. So then the point is that when you take genomic data, then you put them together, you have to align. There are some missing parts, you have to compute where they belong, and then you identify your gene, your genetic code. So if you take 127 million of these reads, a normal computer cluster it takes about 22 minutes to do this process. Well, we did it in 13 seconds. So we have now actually in increased 150 times the acceleration of the processing times. You can see basically 1 billion reads can be done in basically in a few, few minutes. So this changes, first of all, the way we can do personalized medicine, because we can diagnose things very rapidly. Secondly, it enables us now to think really to do mesh computing, because now we have the speed and the software to be able to test if this hypothesis is correct. Now think about the future of our computing, our mobile phones and everything going at speed, which is way, way beyond what we can have today and the capability of store, even in a small uh, component, a tremendous amount of memory. So this is achieved through this so-called Gen Z fabric, which is this memory base. And now Hewlett Packard, together with other companies, are bringing forward. So this is the future for computing. And we have already the software for these computers to be able to do biomedical data. So what are we doing now? And we try to do this before the end of the year. Um, I'm seeing the CEO of HPE to try to be able to convince him to give us other three prototypes. So we're going to locate them at three different sites at the Dizedeni. And then by having a bandwidth on the telecom network, we try to do the first world experiment by which we manipulate genomic data, we'll analyze genomic data at three different sites at the same time. In one of these computers, you can actually deal with 80,000 human genomes at the same time. So now think about your information from telemedicine, from uh, patient data, from uh, genomic analysis, coming back into the same place. It doesn't really matter. You collect the data, you keep them where they are. But then a world of scientists will be able to analyze them instantaneously. Security, extremely good here, because you can have access to a computing system which is not available yet to the hackers, at least. And also, you're not going to have uh, a it's going to be a very, very key uh, guarded system. So we're collaborating now with the Center of Cybersecurity to be able to, in Germany, to be able to make this uh, database secure. And I would predict that within the next two or three years, this is going to be an explosion in this area. So what's the future? Well, of course, I try to convince you that longevity is, and epigenetics are going hand in hand, and also the risk that we pay for longevity is to get some diseases that before we did not get. 
stress responses and metabolism to be able to change the sensitivity of individuals to the disease. Common factors, I mean, we are discovering diabetes and, neuro and uh, neurodegeneration disease. In some cases, cancer is also a, a risk factor. What are the common factors? And one of the things we would like to understand, it is actually what resilience is, studying centenarians, because they are resistant to all of this. So that's another program that we have in the pipeline. In Germany, I would like to create a national research hospital on neurodegenerative diseases. I think this is, uh, it's not the, U the US NIH, it is something which is a network, again, on the model that Dr. Leonardi was showing you earlier on, where we have real care also linked to these institutes. And I think that would be a tremendous improvement because we can do clinical trials on the whole territory. We're already doing this to a certain extent. We need more infrastructure. And of course, then sharing data using mesh computer, which is one of the things that Worldwide is doing. And I think I'll stop it here. I'll be happy to take any questions. So thank you very much, Luigi. Normally, lecture magistralis are not open to questions, but he will be proud, as he said, to, to answer your questions. I suppose there will be many, but I'm sure. If you want to go for if dinner, you... it's also fine. <laughs> so, ju just a curiosity. We have learned from Professor Nicotta how cells die. Now um, we are learning how cells have to cope with, uh, with aging and probably how we have to cope with data. Now, the question is, what would we do with the remaining time because of this major computer? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I always keep saying that uh, when I, and I mean, uh, there is not so much of a difference in age between you and me, but uh, when I was, uh, you know, in my 20s, the promise of computing was you're gonna have more free time, you know? Well, we all know where we are these days. I don't so, think that is going to be necessarily an improvement of life quality. But on the other hand, uh, I, I try to look at it purely from a, a pure decisional point of view. It depends how much you want to be hooked up to your mobile phone <laughs> or how much you want to be free from it. And it's the same story is going to be with this new computing. The only thing that will be good is that, for example, uh, an application of this is going to be traffic regulation. So try to imagine basically this kind of new computing system that instantaneously monitors every car within a nation, within a region, and then try to be able to direct traffic in a way to avoid traffic jams or accidents. Uh, you know, there are several of these applications. This is only one. The self-driving car, for example, is another application. That's very, very interesting because you need a lot of data to be computed at the same time. So, of course, there are going to be benefits, and with benefits, there are also coming risks, of course. So, there are some questions. So, the first one is from Dr. Zampolini, please. Thank you for your presentation, uh, very, very inspiring. And, uh, just, uh, um, I heard that there is another possibility to manage the data, the, also the, the health data, in order to protect the privacy is uh, the, something like the Bitcoin system. Mm -hmm. So they distribute uh, uh, um, uh, spreading of the information, so in this way it uh, should be impossible to, uh, to get the, the private yes. data. And what do you think about this? Uh? Yes, it's definitely a possibility. The only drawback of this is that then you have to share the data. You have to move your data, duplicate them, and put them in different places. Which, of course, with the European regulation for uh, data security, doesn't fit very well. Even with the US, we have problem now, for example, when we have data sharing with the US, because the US regulations are much more open than the European one. Imagine that, for example, you have a clinical study of any type. According to the new European research regulations, the patient has the right at any time to delete the data, to basically say, I want to opt off the study. Now you have to delete that set of data, you're responsible. Now you move the data also to another location because of this share kind of activities, and it becomes increasingly difficult. Also, you have to move the data. The, the speed of the cloud, even if it's going to be bigger and bigger, is not going to be sufficient to store all the data. The data are huge. So we, we can't think to have millions of patients or individuals' data on the cloud, beside the security issue, 
for a pure practical manipulative point of view in the sense that we have to manipulate those data, we have to analyze those data. So I rather believe that this model system will be the future. So uh, thank you very much for stimulating us. I always wonder and think, you know, that uh, the time will come when the child is born you will take the blood or maybe from umbilical cord and uh, you do the genomic and you probably would uh, come to say that, okay, this man is going to have these many diseases in the future. At 10 years, these are the risks. At 40 years, these are the risks. And at 60 years, these are the risks. And probably intervene and uh, stop the disease happening in that particular neonate or adult. Do you think that it could be a reality in uh, coming few years or decades, and do you see that the way things has been progressing, this could come as a reality in the human? I, th I definitely think so. I mean, we already, if you really think about, we are already pretty good at predicting risk. Now, if we stratify patient populations much better, or human beings for that matter, for example, with the Rhineland study, we have normal subjects, uh, and we stratify better and better, we try to be able to narrow down uh, patterns that are frequent in certain people, in certain population, but also envir environmental factors which change the risk for disease. For example, if a population migrates from one place to the other. So in the future, we're going to be able to compute this. And exactly as you say, we just take the blood sample. Maybe we already we keep the placenta sometimes for stem cells. There's going to be a bank. Uh, you have basically all the biosamples from the child. We're going to have a chip into, into our bones someplace that can be scanned, wherever, whatever we do, and there are all our medical data. So when my daughter says, I want to do medicine because she would like to do what her mother does, which is an interventional cardiologist, I say, forget about it, because in 10 years, you're going to have robots doing that. You have to learn it, but you have to learn, you have to know how to do it, but you should study bioinformatics, because I think that's what the future of medicine is. Completely changed, absolutely, I think so. I don't know in how many years, but, and obviously we have to have the knowledge because the knowledge is important, so classical medical education is important, but at the same time we'll be flanked by robotics uh, for surgery, for interventions, at the same time we're trying to be uh, more and more effective in understanding data, so, you know, everything is going to be changed. And, uh, well, you know, I'm looking forward, I'm an optimist. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi. Thank you very much indeed.